Hey, it's Mark Ferguson with Invest For More and I'm back with another video. Today, I'm talking about subject to creative financing and how that works and things to watch out for. So someone commented on my video yesterday how they'd love to know about how this works and I wanted to talk about it. So I know a lot of people out there talk about subject to and creative financing as a way to get involved in real estate. There's a lot of pitfalls and downside to that as well. So it's not always as easy and clean as people make it. Speaking of easy and clean, while I'm talking about this, I wanted to show you one of my worst rental property evictions <laughs> ever. This is one of my properties that got trashed. Oh, this is six years ago? Um, and all my trash videos do really good, but we don't do videos when tenants are really good. So. This isn't normal for my properties, even though we have a lot of tenant drama and different things going on. Usually they look much better than this, but my camera is so shaky. Things have improved since then. So anyway, um, talking about subject to and creative financing. So first off, how I finance a lot of my properties is private financing. I don't know if you would call that creative or not, but basically it's someone I know, usually another investor who wants to make money on the cash they have, they loan it to me. Uh, they get a deed of trust on the properties if it's a flip, sometimes a rental. We pay them interest, and then if we refinance it or sell it, we pay off the loan and pay them back, and it's pretty simple and easy. And we're usually paying from 8 to 10 sometimes 11% on those loans, maybe with a couple of points. So that's pretty straightforward, pretty easy, and probably not what most people consider creative financing, but there's so much opportunity there for private money. And me having this YouTube channel and social media, I have people asking me all the time to lend me money, which is a nice thing. And um, it's a great way to finance some of these properties. It's very easy, you don't have to worry about appraisals, um, closing costs, you know, lender fees, all of that stuff, and usually it's, I send them a text message and they say yes or no, it's that simple. But creative financing, different ones, can get much more complicated and there's many more things to watch out for. So, um, the first one I talk about is subject to. So, that's being pushed by a lot of people who are trying to sell programs and courses and I, I have never taken those courses and programs, I don't know exactly how great they are, I don't wanna say anything bad about them. But subject to is not as clean as easy as a lot of people make it out to be. Basically what that means is you're buying a project, a property subject to the mortgage already in place. So if I put this property up for sale, which I eventually did and actually sold it, we cleaned it up first of course and we had it rented for a couple more years before that. But maybe I put this property up for sale and it actually wouldn't be listed with an agent or go through a title company, because that usually won't work with subject to, maybe some title companies will do it, but I would kind of list it maybe off market or with a wholesaler, and someone could come along, and if I had a $200,000 mortgage on it and I wanted you know, $230,000 for the property, they'd pay me $30,000 and then take over this $200,000 mortgage. Now, the really tricky thing about this is Technically, that violates the loan on almost every mortgage there is. A lender has what's called a due on sale clause, and that due on sale clause says that if you sell the property, they can call that note due. That means if you, if I were to sell it to Bob um, with a quick claim deed or do with a regular deed of deed, warranty deed, special warranty deed, and the lender finds out, they can call the note due right then. And if I can't pay off that loan, they can take it through foreclosure, take the property through that loan. Um, now, it's not the same as an assumption. You might have heard of a loan assumption before, and a lot of loans are actually assumable. FHA, VA loans are usually assumable. What that means is the buyer is taking over the loan from the seller, but the lender knows about it. They go through an assumption process, but the buyer has to qualify for that loan still, right? They've got to qualify for it like it was a regular loan. If it's an FHA loan, they're assuming, and it was an owner-occupied FHA loan, it's got to be owner-occupants who take over that loan and live there for a year, the same guidelines as FHA would have. And then, yeah, if your loan's 200,000 and you're selling the property for 230,000 again, the buyer would have to come up with that down payment or somehow find the money for the difference between the loan and the purchase price. So assumptions are fine. They're totally legal, totally okay, but the buyer still has to qualify for them. An investor 
who's not going to live in the property can't assume an FHA or VA loan that was an owner-occupied loan originally. So there are some caveats to there too. But the subject to one is different than that. That's where you're kind of trying to take over this property, buy this property without the lender really knowing about it. Now you still make the mortgage payments, you still keep up to date on it, but there's huge risk there because it was a disgusting room. If the lender finds out that um, you sold the property or the seller sold the property, they can call that loan due. They can call it due, and if it isn't paid off right away, they can foreclose on the property. And the thing that really bothers me about subject two as well is that person who sold the house to the buyer, so you had this house, you sold it, you kept your loan in place, they're still on the hook for that loan. Right? Once they sell the property, it doesn't relieve them of their credit responsibilities or obligations to repay that loan. They're still on the loan. So if the new buyer does lose the house, it goes into foreclosure, that goes against the seller's credit still. There could be judgments. There can be all kinds of issues because that loan was never paid off or assumed or anything. It's still in that original person's name. And so the person buying it can have some issues. Now, this is a different property. We ran out of time on that other video. This was the crazy one where I bought it from the, um, I believe it's, was it direct marketing or MLS? I can't remember. I think maybe it's the MLS. No, it's direct marketing. But um, at closing, the seller's ex-wife wouldn't move. <laughs> do all kinds of problems and issues. Eventually, we got taken care of, but this was a very interesting house. I actually like this house too. But, um, so the, the subject too can be very risky for a lot of parties involved. Now, if the buyer pays all the mortgage payments, eventually sells the house, pays it off, refinances it, great, it works out perfect. Nothing happens to the original seller of the house, you're fine. But if they don't, there can be a lot of problems. And let's say that person who sold the house subject to wants to go get another mortgage and buy a new house. Well, they've still got this other mortgage in their name that would probably cause them not to be able to qualify for a new property. Or if they're trying to get a car loan or anything like that, like that, that loan is still going to be against their credit and count against them. So it is not a good situation for the seller in most cases. And I think a lot of people doing subject twos aren't clear to the seller exactly how that works and let them know that, hey, you're still obligated on this loan. If something happens, it's on you. So there's a lot of things there that I don't like. I've never done a subject two. I don't ever plan to do a subject two. And it's not a creative financing strategy that I would ever employ because of those downsides and because of how the seller is still responsible for everything pretty much. Um, now, Speaking of the creative financing and, and calling notes due, one thing too is that I get a lot of loans through my local bank as well as private money lenders as I talked about before. My local bank doesn't care if I sell a property to my LLC or switch it between entities of what I have, but big banks might. So when they have that due on sale clause, if you have a property in your name, and then you sell it to like your LLC, even though people say, I'm just putting an LLC's name, you're selling it to your LLC is what you're doing it. That can trigger that due on sale clause too. Now, a lot of people say, well, that'll never be called. That will never happen. The banks won't want to call it. Probably true. There's a very, very small chance you would ever have that loan called due, but there is a chance. And right now, especially if you've got a 3% mortgage or a 3% loan on a house and the bank finds out that, oh, you sold it to your LLC and well, rates right now are 7%, you know, they might be more apt to call that loan or that note due now than they were in the past. So there are some things to think about. I have heard from people who had notes called due, although it is very, very rare. It is something that can happen. And of course, talk to your attorney, accountants, all that stuff for the specific tax advice or specific situations on handling all of that. Now, another creative financing um, situation is seller financing. This is more on the up and up. Not that the other one is technically illegal, but it's definitely on some wishy-washy ground there with subject two. Seller financing is when the seller owns a property and they decide to finance part of the loan for the new buyer. So maybe the seller owns it outright um, or have a ton of equity and they're going to finance the whole shebang, everything for the buyer. Uh, this is a more common type of financing. I've never done seller financing either. I see some seller financing deals once in a while. 
the big downside to seller financing, not always, but usually, is the sellers want pretty high interest rate, a big down payment, and they probably want to see credit and different things and um, might have a short term for the loan too. So in general, you're usually better off getting a bank loan, doing a longer term financing loan with the credit union, whatever it is, than seller financing. In most cases, there are some seller financing deals that work out. So for me, I've never been drawn to seller financing that much because it's there are other better options out there. But there are some properties out there, some special deals where you can get a good seller finance loan and make it work. So I'm not saying it's impossible, it's just rare and um, it is an option. Now, a couple, well, probably more than a couple years ago now, a few years ago, they changed all the rules about seller financing and reporting and documents and all of that. So if you ever do a seller financing agreement, make sure you have an attorney at least advise you, if not write up all the documents to make sure it's done correctly. Because for the most part, you've got to be really careful about how those documents are written up, how the loan's done, how all of that is compiled. So make sure you talk to an attorney, real estate lawyer, uh, to get that all done correctly. If you do go the seller financing route, um, there's a lot of things out there on the internet, <laughs> a lot of advice being given out there. Just because it's online doesn't mean it's correct, doesn't mean it's legal, doesn't mean you should do it. So when you hear about subject two, when you hear about seller financing, when you hear about you know all these different strategies, don't assume just because it's online or in a video that it's legal and is fine to do. So on any of these strategies, if you have any questions, if you're concerned about any of the legality of it, talk to an attorney, talk to an expert in your area and figure out the upside, the downside and any things you need to be careful of. Because remember, if something does go wrong, if you get sued, if you go to court, I don't know is not a defense, right? <laughs> Just because you didn't do your research and you didn't check things out and you didn't know the law doesn't mean you still didn't break the law or cause any problems and it will not protect you if you did something wrong that you weren't supposed to do. So that's the short synopsis, at least my thoughts on those particular creative financing routes. Seller financing is okay. It's just hard to find good terms and good deals. If you can, great. Subject to, I always stay away from personally. I never want to do a subject to deal just because I think it really exposes the seller to something that they aren't aware they're being exposed to and can really, um, really mess up their lives if things go wrong in the long run when they thought they were probably completely done with the deal. And private money, that's my favorite, that's the easiest, and that's what I continue to use, uh, is my route for doing a lot of deals and getting them done And um, when the banks maybe aren't the easiest to work with. All right, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. If you think I said something wrong, I'm always happy to hear it and correct myself. Uh, like always, talk to an attorney, tax person for any specific advice, and this is just kind of an overview of how those work. And um, we'll have more videos, don't worry, on our flips, rentals, laundromats, liquor store, any problems or issues I have coming up, those seem to follow me quite a bit with my properties and uh, tenant stories too. All right, take care. Be back soon.